Now, if y'all would uh, grab you a pen or a pencil, I think we're going to have time. Can we go ahead and start, Richard? Three minutes? No, sir. Don't forget to, uh, the plate that's coming around, that's for our missionary, that uh, we, we support missionaries through our Sunday school class. And we are running a little thin. So uh, don't forget to uh, dig deep. <laughs> Turn to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Dig out a pen and a piece of paper. We're going to use a pen and a piece of paper maybe here in a couple minutes. As Brother Dellis passes the plate, you all write all those $100 checks with that pen I just asked you. That was the whole reason of digging that pen, so you could fill out those uh, checks, those $100 checks for our missionary and Sunday school class. Brother Bobby, would you pray for us, please, Bobby Williams? Amen. Thank you, Brother Bobby. Good to have Brother Cody back, wherever Brother Cody is. He's here someplace. Good to have him back. There's Miss Mary. Good to have Miss Mary back with us. Amen. Amen. Uh, pray, for, uh, pray for those that are normally here. Uh, we've had some folks that have been out for a while. Pray for those that, uh, that haven't been here for a while. Pray that they uh, get back in church. Pray for those that are sick, Faye and Tom, uh, some folks that are that are generally faithful, but for health reasons and stuff, can't be here. Uh, we good to go, Brother Richard? All right, we're moving on. So Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, we're going to be in Ephesians all morning this morning. Uh, several years ago, we've talked about it before, several years ago, Candy and I and a couple of our friends from back in West Virginia, uh, we had the opportunity uh, to make a trip out west. And uh, we visited the Grand Canyon, which is in southern Arizona. Uh, we were able, we were only able, we were only going to be able to stay for a couple days. So we hit the more touristy area of the Grand Canyon, which is the South Rim. You can either visit the North Rim of the Canyon or you can visit the South Rim of the Canyon. So we got us a little cabin, which was just a few hundred uh, feet from the South Rim of the Canyon. And uh, has anybody, show of hands, how many people have been to the Grand Canyon? So there's a few people here been to the Grand Canyon. I had never been to the Grand Canyon. Of course, I had heard of the Grand Canyon my entire life. 
my grandfather had visited the Grand Canyon probably back in the early 60s or mid 60s. I had seen TV shows of the Grand Canyon. I had been told how vast and how breathtaking that the Grand Canyon was. Uh, the first thing you noticed, or the first thing that I noticed when I got to the park was how crowded it was, how many people were there. We drove into the park and we're circling around and we're looking for our little cabin and uh, to unload our belongings. And there are buses and there are cars and there are people everywhere. And soon thereafter, we made the short walk to the south rim of the canyon, probably less, it was less than 100 yards from our cabin to the south rim of the canyon. And again, there are people bustling about around everywhere. There are cars, there are tour buses, people circling around looking for parking spots. And in the back of my mind, in the back of my mind, I had this picture of what I thought that I was going to see when I stepped to the rim of the canyon. After all, the Grand Canyon is going to be big. It is, after all, grand. Amen? But then, but then, you take those last few steps to the edge of the canyon, and you see with your own eyes, you see God's handiwork. And then all of a sudden, all of the people and all of the cars seem to vanish away into the distance. The sounds, the shuffling of the feet, they cease to be heard. And the vastness and the beauty of what God has created pulls you in and envelops you. And suddenly, suddenly standing there on the edge of that canyon, you realize how small you really are. And how vast the world is. And more importantly, you realize how great our God really is. Amen. It's amazing how God can create something so beautiful in such an arid and dry place. There's not a lot of beauty in the Grand Canyon. There's not a lot of greenery. It's basically just some pine trees. And other than that, it's rocks. There's a river in the bottom and that's about it. But God being God, he can and does have a place of beauty for each and every creature in his creation. What we may see is inhospitable, an inhospitable location, dry and arid and hot. Or what we may see is an impossible situation. God can use to create beauty and create wonder. Just south of the Grand Canyon, in southern Arizona, lies the Sonoran Desert. The Sonoran Desert runs through southern Arizona all the way across to southern California and down into northern Mexico. In southern Arizona, the Sonoran Desert receives 0.58 inches of rain per year. As Grandma would say, that is just a smidgen, just a smidgen over a half of inch half an inch of rain per year. In the summer, it regularly reaches over 100 degrees. Many days, it gets up to 105 to 107 degrees. But yet in January and December and January, it goes down into the 30s and 40s at night. In the month of March that we just came through, they average seven hundredths of an inch of rain. Seven hundredths of an inch. In the month of April, which we are in right now, since 1985, the Sonoran Desert, on average, averages three hundredths of an inch of rain in the month of April. Just for comparison's sake, I looked it up, and in Wilmington at the airport, our driest month in this area is January. In the month of January, we average 1.93 inches of rain. That's two, basically two inches of month, uh, and that's our driest month. In the month of April that we're in right now, we average 3.19 inches compared to 0 0.03 inches of rain in the Sonoran Desert. Our wettest month of, is August, 
where we average basically about 5.5 inches of rain in one month. They get a half inch of rain in an entire year. The point being, the Sonoran Desert is a tremendously, tremendously hostile environment. But late at night, in this harsh environment, if you listen closely, you can hear a faint, high-pitched howl. But most would never imagine where this source of this sound was coming from. And we'll give some of you the willies now. The source of this high-pitched howl comes from a small, yet mighty, grasshopper mouse. A little mouse. This little rodent comes out late at night. And science says, mankind says, he howls into the darkness to mark its territory. And let other grasshopper mice know that this little piece of desert belongs to this one particular little mouse. Because of this peculiar behavior, many have dubbed this little rodent the werewolf mouse. Another odd behavior of this little mouse is the fact that it is carnivorous. It is a meat eater. The grasshopper mouse doesn't eat seeds and vegetation like many of its cousin. It eats other creatures. And one in particular creature that this mouse eats that almost no other animal or beast wants any part of. Of course, with a name like grasshopper mouse, we can assume that it eats grasshoppers and other assorted insects. But the one desert dweller that hardly anyone bothers, but the werewolf mouse feeds on, on a regular basis, is the scorpion. Some might say it's just a matter of evolution. But others may believe that God has given this mouse several particular gifts to deal with the scorpion. Amen. Number one, these little mice are resistant to scorpion venom. The venom of the scorpion that would kill most other mice has no effect on the werewolf mouse. And not only that, God has given our little mouse friend the ability to convert the toxin from the scorpion sting into painkiller within their own system. So not only does the sting not kill them, but there is a decided reduction, a reduction in the effect of the pain of the sting itself. There's something a little inspiring about a little animal's ability to withstand such terrible living conditions, being stung with poison, yet God, God has designed it in such a way that this little werewolf mouse not only just survives, but thrives. I mentioned before that my, mankind and science says that this little mouse goes out late at night and howls at the moon and the stars just to mark his territory. Just to let all the other mice know that this section of desert is his and that they should stay away. After all, they'll tell you that this little mouse ha only has a brain the size of a pea. He has no sense of self or who he is or his place in the world or the fact that there is a greater power out in the universe other than himself. He's just a little mouse sitting on a rock, howling at the moon, marking his territory. Come on, brother. But what if? Humor me. Humor me if you would. What if? What if our little werewolf mouse is out there in the middle of the night, looking up into the starry sky. Amen. And I understand he doesn't have a soul. And he may not understand who God is. But just suppose, just suppose he's sitting out there on his little rock, howling his little heart out, and thanking the God creator of all for all the gifts that he has. He may not understand the who and the why, 
But what if he's just out there thanking the creator of all for just being able to exist and to be alive and for the gifts and the abilities that allow him to survive? The world says that's impossible. He doesn't have any sense of self that would allow him to realize that there is a God creator. But yet in the same breath, the world would tell you he has enough sense of self to go out and howl at the moon and tell all the other mice to stay out of his yard. And then again, the world would probably tell you that I don't have any sense for making such a crazy statement about our little friend. When in reality, it sounds to me like the only one of us that has any sense at all is the little mouse. This little mouse is an example of the handiwork of God. The kind of marvelous craftsmanship that we see all around us when we just take the time to look. And this craftsmanship of God's unique design extends to each of us as well. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. Verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. By grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God. Salvation. Salvation is the gift that we receive from God. Amen. When someone gives you a gift, the appropriate response should be simply, thank you. Not, that's a very nice gift. How much do I owe you? We should be more like our friend, the mouse, and just be thankful. And not spend our time as Christians trying to work our way to heaven to pay for a great gift that was given to us freely. Amen. The price was paid for us on the cross. And if we are truly saved, it is the fact of our trust in Christ and our salvation that should then lead us to work for him, not the other way around. Amen? Amen. We as true believers, we as the saved, we look around us in our world today, we watch the news, we read the feeds on our phones and on our computers, and we scratch our heads and we wonder, what in the world is going on? What in the world's going on in the world around us? As true believers in Christ, we too, we too find ourselves in the midst of a desert. We find ourselves, we find our lives, we live our lives in the midst of a spiritual desert. The world around us seems to be dry and empty of almost anything godly or Christ-like. It seems as though Satan is coming out ahead at almost every turn. God is being kicked out of our society a school system that was once formed to teach youth to read the Bible. Jesus now no longer is welcome within the walls of the public schools. Uh, this week sometimes, look on your phones, look up the old deluder Satan law, D-E-L-U-D-E-R, the old deluder Satan law. In 1600 in the state of Massachusetts, the public school system was formed with the old deluder Satan law. The whole reason of the public school system that was formed in Massachusetts was to teach the youth of the state of Massachusetts to read and understand the Bible. That was the reason the school system was formed. But worse yet today, the public school teaches the opposite of Christ. We're frowned on to pray in public because we may hurt someone's feelings or make someone feel uncomfortable. It's narrow-minded of us to tell the world that Jesus Christ is the only way. We're told that there are many ways for someone to get to heaven. 
Even though Jesus himself said in John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one cometh to the Father but by me. Amen. When we say, when we say the Bible is perfect and infallible, we're told we, should be, we shouldn't be so closed-minded that no book written by man can be perfect. And they would be correct. No book written by man is perfect and infallible. But they fail to see and believe what we as Christians know. In 2 Timothy 3 and 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen? Amen. Take your pen. I ask you all to take out a pen. Take your pen out for a second. Get your piece of paper out of your Bible. I ask you to write your name on a piece of paper. Pen, pencil, it doesn't make any difference. Just write your name on a piece of paper. Marker, crayon, whatever. Everybody done? Show of hands now, how many people wrote your name on a piece of paper? All those hands. You're all wrong. I hate to tell you that. The pen, the pencil, we've done this before in Sunday school class, wrote the name. You simply guided it. In the same way, God used all the people that wrote this book just as you used your pen to write this book. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen. Amen? Amen? It sometimes feels like the world is closing in on us as Christians. Like the world just keeps getting bigger and bigger and we as believers are getting smaller and smaller by the day. Satan and the world hurl darts and stinging arrows at us and it feels sometimes like we just keep getting pummeled and beaten. Taking sting one after another, sting after sting, one fiery dart on top of another fiery dart. But remember our little friend, the grasshopper mouse, the werewolf mouse. God had given him special gifts, special protections that allow him to not just survive, but to thrive in a harsh desert environment. He not only survived the harsh sting of the scorpion, but in the end, the sting didn't hurt nearly as much. And not only that, he used Mr. Scorpion for nourishment. He ate him. If God will do that for a mouse out in the desert, will he not do much more for you and I? If God will do the same for the beasts of the fields, will he not do much more for you and I? Turn to Ephesians, well, we're going to read Ephesians 2, and 8, 2, 8, and 9 one more time. What gift does God give to us? Verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We sit in high places with Christ through his blood. The gift the gift given to us is salvation through faith. So what protection does this salvation provide from the sting of that old scorpion, Satan? Turn to Ephesians 6, verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with preparation of the gospel of peace. 
and above all taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with the perseverance and supplication for all saints. In the Christian life, as true believers, we fight, as Scripture tells us, against principalities and against powers and against rulers of darkness of the world and against spiritual wickedness. God, through the Scripture, has given us a system of defense against an enemy, against an enemy that we cannot, we cannot defeat on our own. But many churchgoers... Many church-going Christians have one huge problem here in Ephesians 6. A huge problem. How many this morning, where this is, this is class participation again, how many here this morning believe, show of hands, that there is a God in heaven? Raise your hand and let God know that you actually believe He's real. Amen? Get all Pentecostal. How many believe that everything in this book is true? Every word, every jot, every tittle. Amen. But yet, but yet, how many people in church, how many Bible-thumping Christians around the world, when we start talking about Satan, or the rulers of darkness, or the powers of the world, how many people, how many Christians say or think, well, you know, Brother Gary, that's a little bit far-fetched. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ, like the Bible says. But that whole thing about Satan walking about seeking whom he may devour in 1 Peter 5 and 8, that's a little bit hard for me to swallow. This book is either completely true or it's not true at all. We can't believe in God and Jesus Christ, but not believe in Satan and his helpers. They are just as real as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy, Holy Ghost. The problem that so many Christians have with the armor of God in Ephesians 6 is too many don't believe that Satan is as real as Christ, or they don't take Satan as seriously as they do the rest of the book. They've again chosen to pick and choose. Pick and choose in Scripture what they believe and thrown out what they don't believe or what they just don't really want to talk about. So if Satan isn't as real as Christ, then these Scriptures on the armor of God are Scriptures that I can just kind of skip over because that whole Satan and his minion thing that's just kind of a made-up story anyway. If it's not real, then it's not as real as the rest of the book. If Satan isn't real, why do I need the armor of God in the first place? One more time. If God is real, if Christ is real, the Holy Spirit is real, if you believe this book is telling you the truth, then you must also believe what it says about Satan and that he is just as real as the rest. And if Satan is real, we must also understand that, again, we cannot win battles against him on our own. He will come after us. He will sling his fiery darts at us. And we need protection. We absolutely need help. And the only place from which that help can come is from the Lord. And God provides us a suit of armor to withstand the onslaught of the attack. Let's look again at verse 10. Chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of of his might. It says, be strong in the Lord. Our strength comes from one source and one source only. Our strength comes from God. Amen. 
Once again, nothing we do, no work that we can accomplish, no hoops that we can jump through, no amount of people that we can help, as good a thing as that is, no amount of people that we help within the church, as good a thing as that is, no amount of money that we give to the church is going to make any difference. All our strength comes from the Lord and the power of His might. That's what it says in verse 10. Let's read verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on the whole, whole armor of God. We can't pick and choose the pieces that we want to put on. We talk all the time about we can't go through Scripture and just pick out the verses that we like and throw away the rest. It's the same with the armor of God. You can't just pick out the pieces that you want to put on and leave behind the rest. We can't just put on the helmet and shot our feet and not put on the rest of the armor. If we do, we will leave ourselves vulnerable to be wounded. Satan is smart. You've got to give him credit for that. And he will always go after us where we are the weakest. Satan knows, Satan knows, Satan knows. Look back into your life. I look back into my life. He always, always, he knows where Gary struggles. And he always hits me. Not where I'm the strongest. He always comes after me where I am the weakest. And I guarantee he's doing the, he'll do the same to you time and time again. We can't depend on doing things halfway. We can't depend on doing things the way we want to do things. We must do things God's way. And God tells us what? He tells us to put on all the armor of God. Amen. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. It says there we wrestle not against flesh and blood. There was a time when some of us may have been able to handle ourselves against someone of this world. I haven't always been an old fat guy. There was a time in my life, I graduated from high school, I was six foot three and weighed 175 pounds. When trouble came into my life, there was a lot of cutting and shooting going on, Brother Ken. I cut around the corner and I shot for home. Because <laughs> even in my younger days, I wasn't a fighting kind of person. But this is a different kind of fight. Amen. This is not a worldly fight. This is a fight that we can't fight and win on our own. Again, not a worldly fight. This is a fight against spiritual wickedness. That we cannot, we cannot, I can't stress it enough, we cannot win it on our own. We need God's help. Amen. Verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that we may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Notice there, stand. Notice how many times we see the word stand in these verses. Again, it tells us in verse 13 to put on the whole armor of God. It's mentioned twice to put on the whole armor of God. God's trying to tell us something. Put on the whole armor of God. But then he tells us to withstand the day. This is not just a single shot across the bow from Satan. This is a battle that lasts. We don't know when the day will come. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be multiple days. It will be unexpected. That day may and probably will last. It's going to be over and over again. Satan will come after you. He will come over and over and over again and again and again. Verse 14. Stand. We see the word stand again. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Loins, it says, loins girt about with truth. Truth is the knowledge of God's Word, the knowledge of Scripture, the Bible that we hold in our laps, knowledge of this book. 
This keeps coming up. God keeps bringing this back over and over again. Brother John taught on it. We've talked about it two or three times. The Berean church getting in the scripture, studying the scripture daily. We need to know what's in this book and what this book says. Amen. Knowledge of the Bible. The ancient soldiers' loins were girt about with a large leather belt that held most of the rest of the pieces of their armor in place. It held the breastplate in place in the front and the back and held the, the armor that was on their thighs. It held, it held all that stuff in place. Similarly, the Christian armor depends on and are held in place by the spiritual belt of truth, this book. Again, if we don't know it, it's not going to hold much in place. That's why we have to know what's in this book. The belt of truth that is the truth of the Word of God that holds our armor in place. The breastplate of righteousness uh, represents a holy character, our moral conduct, obedience, obedience to this book, obedience to the truth of this book produces a godly life, a Christ-like life. Verse 15, and we're going through this quick because we're wanting to get to something else. Not that this isn't important. Verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel gives a peace to the believer that frees them from anxiety through the truth of God's word. Again, the truth of God's word, even though he advances against a powerful adversary. If we truly believe that the truth of the gospel, there is a peace that enters into our life that frees us from the anxiety of the battle. We don't have to sit around and worry if we believe the truth of this gospel. It gives us a certain peace against the attacks of Satan if we believe the truth in this book. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The shield of faith quenches the fiery darts of the wicked, it tells us in verse 16. Simply put, the shield is our faith in God and our faith that all his promises are true. Everything he says, he will do. Amen. The gospel is true. When God tells us in James 4 and 7, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you, we believe the promise of the word of God. We believe that that promise in James is true. That promise is, and other promises in this book, those promises are our shield. The faith that those promises are true, that is our shield. We'll come back to verse 16 here in a moment. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Knowing that we are saved. Again, this is our armor against attacks from Satan, attacks against the world, uh, from the world. Knowing that we are saved. Satan cannot take that salvation away from us. A feeling of calm and assurance of our salvation. Once saved, always saved. The sword of the Spirit. When it speaks here of the sword of the Spirit, it doesn't mean the entire book. The sword of the Spirit here is individual scriptures. Those individual scriptures, that reverts back to Christ repeating scriptures of Satan during the temptation in his 40 days in the wilderness. Memorizing scripture is important. And I'll admit to you, I am not the greatest of being able to memorize from one end to the other every single scripture in the Bible. But I can remember enough. I can remember enough. When something comes, you'll be amazed at how God will pop something back in your head. Amen. And if nothing else, I got one of them fancy phones where I can remember enough of it where I can punch it in there and it'll pop right back up. And it, but there's enough of it in here to where I can get a hold of it. Amen? Memorize some scripture in your life. God will give it to you when you need it. Verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praying always, it says in verse 18. Without prayer, without prayer, God's armor is inadequate to achieve victory. 
We just can't put on the armor and then not pray. Prayer keeps us close to God. Remember back in James it says, Submit yourself to God and the devil will flee. That prayer keeps you close to God. Prayer is indispensable. We can't just put on the armor and then go sit in the corner. Remember back there where I said, look at how many times it tells you to stand? We have to stand with God. The armor is of no use without prayer. It says always. Always means on every occasion. When Satan attacks, the very first thing we should think of as Christians is to stop and pray. It says watching thereunto in verse 18 means we are to be vigilant, vigilant in our prayer life. We are to be vigilant with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. That's what it tells us in verse 18. That means we should be vigilant in our prayer life, not just for ourselves, but for the other saints of God, for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, once again in Scripture, it tells us we are supposed to pray one for another. Now, we've gone through this quick. This is just a thumbnail over the top. We've just hit the highlights of the armor of God. We could go back. We could study on this for weeks. But what we're wanting to go back and look at now is Ephesians 6 and 16. Chapter 6. Go back and look at 16 one more time. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye all will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Our faith extinguishes the fiery darts of the devil. Our faith in Christ, we, uh, by that we set in the high places with Christ. And that faith in Christ is our protection, is that gift, is that shield that we are given to stand up to all the fiery darts that Satan and the world shoot our way. Just like God gave the mouse the ability to take the sting of the scorpion, not only can we now take on those stings, we can receive such stings without there being as much pain. God gave the mouse the ability to produce painkiller from the venom injected by the scorpion. Our painkiller comes not from the sting of Satan, but from the great physician. Again, our, our, our reduction, our reduction of pain in any situation reverts back to the amount of faith we have in Christ who sets in high places. Do we have faith in Christ? Do we believe that God knows what is best for us? Even in times that may seem uncomfortable and painful in the moment. Romans 8 and 28, one of my favorite scriptures. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Do we trust God in the bad times as well as the good? If our answer to this question is yes, then the sting of Satan has just automatically been turned into painkiller by our faith in God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Our mouse friend, after the initial sting from the scorpion, through the gifts and abilities that God gave him, turned what for most of the world is a venomous, poisonous creature, God now turns the scorpion into nourishment for the grasshopper mouse. We, in turn, are dodging the darts thrown at us by the devil. We are stung on a regular basis by the world around us. And God can and will, can and will nourish us, even though our hurts may be less. Because of our faith in Christ, we will still have some pain in our life. But at each and every turn, when our faith in Christ brings us through a time of hurt or a time of pain, 
when Christ holds our hand and leads us through to the other side. We may not have physical nourishment like the mouse, but we will have spiritual nourishment because our faith will be nourished and strengthened through the stings and discomforts of what God has just brought us through and that and what God has brought other brothers and sisters through. Uh, testimonies. We have testimonies in church. It nourishes me. It nourishes my faith when God brings one of you all through something that I know you've been struggling with. And hopefully when God brings us through, Candy and I through something, it, it, nourish, it nourishes people. It nourishes our faith when God brings us through something. There is, however, there is, however, one primary difference between us and our friend, the grasshopper mouse. God bestowed the abilities of our mouse friend without any other thought on his or her part. God bestowed the abilities on our mouse friend without them even thinking about it. God just gives them the abilities because, again, we must remember they don't have a soul and they have a brain the size of a pea. But mankind, on the other hand, we have a choice. We are just as much God's handiwork as the grasshopper mouse. But we must choose. We must choose to put on the armor of God. Because God, because God gave us free will. God wants us to choose to love Him. God wants us to choose His protection. God wants us to choose to have faith in Him. So no matter where you are, whether you're standing on the edge of a great canyon, feeling small, or maybe all alone, or if you feel you're in the midst of a desert, dry and desolate, and you're getting pummeled from all sides. Turn to Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. And remember, remember to put on all the armor of God. And know without a shadow of a doubt that you are never, never, never alone. God is always there. He's always by your side. God is always holding your hand. There is protection from any and every onslaught. No matter how large the problem may be or how small the obstacle, obstacle may make you feel, that protection, that help is always near. That protection comes from only one place, from the Lord through salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6, 16. Taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Amen? Brother Ken, would you pray for us, please?